Welcome, everybody. Welcome, attendees. We're so thankful that you've joined us for our webinar this afternoon. And uh, it's just an honor to have some of these spaces. This is one of the silver linings, constellations of this time uh, that we get to reinvent some ideas and say, hey, why not? Let's try some other things. And so we're super excited that you've joined us, whether you're watching a future recording or you're on here live. Um, thank you. Thank you for taking time to do this. We are really excited to uh, welcome uh, Lester and Caleb to the call. Uh, Melissa is helping with some of the admin stuff. She's in, a part of Vineyard Worship as well, um, overseeing events, and she's the Zoom master. So we're excited to have her a part of us. My name's Mike O'Brien. I'm the director of the Vineyard School of Worship. And Vineyard School of Worship is part of Vineyard Worship, which is a uh, extension of Vineyard USA. Uh, 600, uh, 550 churches across the country, and um, we help create the soundtrack to what God is saying and doing in our movement via music, via our Ferment podcast, which is incredible, and different training opportunities throughout uh, the year. So. This webinar, this is probably our first webinar as a Vineyard School of Worship, and I am super excited that you guys joined us and are a part of what we're doing. So church history, both uh, historically, like the ancient church history is important to us. What we do on the weekends when we play our four or five songs and read our scriptures or even what we're doing from our home. But uh, recent church history, like contemporary worship, like when did it start? Why did it start? Where are we at in the timeline of history? Our dot right now, when it says COVID pandemic, what is happening here and what is happening in the, in the you know, where we are at in history matters. And uh, that's part of what today's discussion is about. We encourage you to submit your questions. There should be a Q&A section where you can submit your questions to all the panelists. Um, you can submit them to individual people, but if you send them to every all of us it'll be super helpful because we're not sure in the heat of the teaching if we'll be able to respond to everything so feel free to uh, send your questions as we go along Lester made it clear that he does not want this to be a hundred percent lecture but that we would have a conversation and that we would ask great questions um, and uh, there is no stupid question so it's okay to ask anything so I want to introduce Caleb uh, Caleb Maskell uh, is a pastor, a worship leader, a theologian. He oversees the Vineyard Scholars, which is an incredible movement that's been going for a long time, having these sorts of conversations for a long time. And we are super excited to have him. He just finished up a very important degree, uh, his PhD. And we are excited to have him, ladies and gentlemen, Caleb Masco. Hey, everybody. Uh, nice to see everybody logging in here. And, uh, Excited for this afternoon. Um, I don't have a ton that I want to say right now, except that I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm outside Philadelphia. I'm in Media, Pennsylvania, uh, which is close to Philadelphia Airport. If you've ever been to the airport, you've been about a stone's throw from my house, from which I am now broadcasting live. And um, yeah, actually, last week was going to be the gathering of the Society of Vineyard Scholars. We were going to be in Chicago. Uh, this year with a number of different uh, folks uh, who were going to be with us. And of course, we were uh, sad, but uh, happy on the other hand to cancel because of what all is going on. So it's nice to get the opportunity to do uh, an afternoon event like this. It feels similar to probably some of what we would have uh, been doing. Um, currently, actually, I've, I've uh, resigned from my worship pastor job, which I held for many years at Blue Root Vineyard, and I've been leading worship in the vineyard uh, in different churches and, uh, and church plants that my wife, Kathy, and I have been involved in for like 20 years. So to me, the language of the vineyard, the first language of the vineyard is probably worship. It's not as... is the thing that has made most made us who we are uh,
Caleb, you're freezing up on us pretty significantly. We thought we'd catch up to you. <laughs> but um, yeah, you're frozen, FYI, if you can hear us. So maybe I'll text Caleb and let him know he's frozen because he was just saying some good stuff there. Is he frozen for you guys too? Okay, cool. Frozen up. Let me text him and see if I can. Oh, he's gone. We'll see if we can bring him back. Professor Caleb. Ah. So I will tell you, um, uh, this is one of Lester's books. Uh, as far as it connects to the vineyard, this is a brilliant and wonderful book, uh, Worshiping with the Anheim Vineyard, and uh, co-written by Cindy Rothmeyer and Andy Park. And I was just thumbing through it again today, and it's just so good. It's got so much good little nuggets and information in it. So just encourage you to pick this up. Um, if you're part of the vineyard and you're curious about the history, this lays it out. It feels like you're walking through a museum at the Smithsonian and it's got a bit of, uh, a bit of what's going on. And I thought about that, how cool it would be to have, I don't know what happened to Wimber's, John Wimber's Rhodes piano, but I think it's pretty cool that he, he led, he led worship from the uh, Fender Rhodes uh, at the beginning of this thing. Really, you can see that picture on here and that's Carl Tuttle and uh you know so really really beautiful thing for any and all of us to get into this and I'm I came into the vineyard in 94 so I'm in this like middle gap generation um but wherever you're at in in coming into the vineyard this is this is really good stuff Caleb you're back are you back or are you frozen oh wait I got you sorry yeah, you're okay. there you go. sorry, guys. We've been having some occasional internet issues, so I will uh, just apologize and move on. <laughs> I think you covered what I was saying, Mike, huh? A little bit, yeah, yeah. Okay. All I wanted to say was you guys should buy and read this book. <laughs> it's called Worshiping with the Anaheim Vineyard. <laughs> if you ordered it on Amazon, maybe we can put the link in the chat. Yeah, uh, it would be a great book for you to read if you want to learn about vineyard worship some more. And in light of that, can I just introduce Lester? Yeah. Lester, go ahead. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I, I do appreciate the pitch for the book. I wanted to point out somebody else. This is partly him behind the symbol is Eddie Espinoza. Hmm who after Carl becomes a uh, pastor and church planner on his own, Eddie would be the second worship leader there in John Wimber's congregation. And if you know the song, Change My Heart, O God, that's Eddie Espinoza's uh, song. So anyway, it's a great pleasure to be with you. I have a deep affection uh, for the vineyard um, for a variety of reasons. Part of it's Caleb and um, Maskell and the Society of Vineyard Scholars that I've been happy to be part of a couple of times. Uh, I've met, uh, met and um, lots of vineyard friends, both researching this book and another presentation I did a couple of summers ago. And my ongoing research uh, has me uh, constantly dabbling in vineyard topics. Um, per perhaps just a word or two about myself so you can kind of locate and place me. Um, the, perhaps the best way to explain who I am is that I'm a, a pastor who got an interest in worship history in order to try to revitalize my own congregation. Um, and that evolved into being a worship historian with a concern, pastoral concern for all congregations, if that makes a sense. Um, so my, my, my deep Felt, um, heartfelt, deepest sort of desire is to try to mine the riches of 20 centuries of worship history in order to try to find ways to revitalize uh, congregations today and keep their worship living and vital and 
full of the praise that is uh, due to God. So I'm happy to be with you, and I'm hoping the next hour or so uh, fulfills that task. Um, do you mind if I go ahead and just start talking about what I've been working on recently? Um, so uh, after doing the Anaheim Vineyard book, I and a music professor at the University of Toronto, Sui Hong Lim, worked on a short book um, called Loving on Jesus, A Concise History of Contemporary Worship. And it was our attempt to try to uh, unpack all the different dimensions of the what some people call praise and worship, some people call contemporary worship, and the vineyard, y'all tend just to call it worship. Um, uh, where did it all come from? And that book is organized topically. Um, the chapters are organized topically, and that came out 2017. In fact, about the same year the Worshiping with the Anaheim Vineyard book came out, although the Anaheim Vineyard book had been in process for a lot longer. Um, Sui Hong and I decided we were not done uh, with this topic. And in fact, I, I don't anticipate uh, focusing on any other topic for the remainder of my active research and teaching career, which is about another, another 10 years. So he and I are working on a much bigger book called Presence and Purpose, How Two Ideas Changed the Face of Protestant Worship, um, and gave us what we, oh, the term he and I are using is uh, contemporary praise and worship, kind of an all-embracing sort of term. Um, so essentially, it's how two ideas have changed the face of Protestant worship. One of the ideas is, um, is something that the vineyard would have bought into in their own distinctive way. And it's the idea that when God's people praise God, uh, God is present in the midst of all of that praise. And the keynote verse is Psalm 22, 3. So uh, we have four chapters dedicated to that. And I just finished the draft of chapter four, which brings that part of the story up to about 1995 or so. The other idea is a much more strategic one. And it's the idea, or it's the fear, actually, that the church is conservative in its worship, but people are changing, and therefore a gap has been created, and therefore the church needs to be creative and innovative and start adaptation in order to try to overcome that gap. And there was a real surge of that um, right after World War II in terms of updating music in parachurch organizations in order to try to reach youth which in the late 1940s, doing uh, contemporary uh, music for youth in a worship setting meant a uh, big band, um, Clint Miller sort of stuff. Um, and the keynote verse there is actually 1 Corinthians 9, 22, becoming all things um, to all people in order that we might be able to win some. And those two ideas really have just reshaped the face of Protestant worship. Uh, 70 years after that. So Sui Hong and I are currently working on that. Uh, within that larger framework, I've been um, expanding what I've been doing in vineyard worship, both prior to this book and also after the time frame of that book, which only goes for about the first five or six years of the Anaheim Vineyard Congregation, so about 77 to 82 or so. Um, so the pre-work, I've actually become uh, decent friends with Ken Gullickson, the original Vineyard Church planter. Um, and so between interviews with him and his wife, Joni, and um, Bill Dwyer, who uh, is the longest serving vineyard pastor in the same congregation. He planted his vineyard congregation in 1977 and has still been there. He's the only pastor that congregation has ever had. Um, between interviews with those folks and additional material that I've been able to dig up, um, I've been writing on what vineyard worship was like before John Wimber and his congregation there in Orange County um, got involved in vineyard worship. And it's been a really exciting story. I, I think my biggest kind of insight um, from that is that this important category of intimacy which I see all over vineyard material uh, in the 80s and 1990s and even still, um, that category 
I think traces all the way back to Ken Gullickson. Um, 1974, he cuts an album called Charity. Um, it's put out there, Maranatha Music. Ken was a former staff person at the Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa there in Orange County. And after the first song, as a spoken transition to the second song, uh, Ken begins to quote from Song of Solomon in the Old Testament and starts talking about God's desire to have uh, of an intimate relationship with the church. And uh, Ken built that into all of the original Vineyard Church plants. And I think um, it was already a natural part of the piety or the spirituality there in John Wimper's congregation um, in Orange County. And I think they just picked it up and that's why there was a nice kind of synthesis there. The other aspect of Vineyard worship that I've been working on is the development of this Vineyard model for ordering a worship service. And by the time you get to the 1990s, especially um, the publications and the standard teaching um, that John Wimber is doing, and by, the, by after 82, he's the national and then the international leader of the Vineyard Movement until his death in the mid 1990s. Um, uh, that by the late 80s into the 90s, you start getting a, he, Wimber teaches a fivefold sort of. Uh, model for this is how you normally put together a worship service. It starts with a call to worship and then engagement and then expression and then it goes to intimacy and then it's an offering of yourself um, uh, back in service to God for the sake of the world is the fifth phase. Um, so I've done, gosh, um, Eddie Espinosa has also become a good friend of mine. So I've probably done collectively maybe five to six to seven hours worth of interviews with Eddie Espinoza. Um, and what's become real clear to me is that that vineyard model, that those five phases, is actually a re-articulation of some older theology that was circulating more widely in Pentecostalism um, in the, starting in the late 60s into the 70s and the early 80s. Um, uh, Eddie had been um, converted in one of those churches, it was called a Restoration Church or a Latter Rain Church, still there in Orange County in Southern California. And he brought those sensibilities, and I think is in conversations um, there in the staff there at the Anaheim Vineyard Congregation that that uh, five-fold, five-phase vineyard model was articulated, and um, they started um, publishing it in 1987. I found three different versions of it from 1987, and they all differ just a little bit. Uh, in fact, um, John Wimber's original version had um, seven phases to it, not five. Um, but that's the sort of um, stuff that I do. Hopefully, when it comes out in the book, it won't be boring. I will try to tie it into a much larger, interesting narrative. Um, and uh, that's what I've been uh, working on in terms of um, history of worship. Oh, let me do it. I do want to show one picture here. Uh, This is the original Vineyard congregation. Um, and the backstory here is, is um, and I think this is probably Ken Gullickson right there in the middle. Uh, uh, Ken started the church planting by starting uh, Bible studies. Um, and from the Bible studies, then they would grow and then they would rent larger spaces. And there was a period of time, about a year, where they just thought, you know, this is Southern California. Let's just go to the public beach. And that's what they would do. And Sunday school for the kids, they would move the kids off to one side. And in fact, you can see one child right there. And um, if they needed to do baptisms, there's the Pacific Ocean. Um, uh, the, talking to the folks, the feelings were kind of mixed about this. It was a lovely setting, and they would have people wander in, um, but the, the acoustics were really bad. Uh, the constant roar of the ocean, and they had to coach in the um, amplification system uh, every week. Um, the story that I have in my mind is that Ken went on a trip, and while he was gone, 
uh, the folks in the congregation went and found another church that they could rent. Um, and he came back and they said, we have a, we have a building lined up again. We're going to go to the building now, um, which happened to be a United Methodist church um, in Van Nuys, perhaps, but, uh, in that area. But it was, um, it, it was a very fluid sort of situation. And uh, if you know Ken Gullickson at all, he, um, it's no surprise that Charity is the uh, name of his original album. Um, very loving person, and he just uh, built that into the original congregation. Questions or comments? Can I? Can I kind of? Yeah, yeah that's in? great. That's that's beautiful. Before, can we? Do you mind if you just zoom out just a little bit for okay. and school us on? For, you know, this week many of us are just preparing our set list, four or five songs, and working with our preacher to get our you know living room worship into the computers of our congregation um why does why does church history matter for us those you know i'm just picking out some songs and doing my best to to serve my pastor in the church with music why does church history matter not not only going back 2000 years but for our particular movement um, or movements, if I'm a Methodist or I'm a, why would it be important that I study um, the the foundations of my particular stream? And why is it important to understand the foundations of, it's a huge question, but sure. big picture, what, what does that mean for us as modern day worship, worship leaders? So I've been giving some thought to this, and I think what the current situation is allowing us to do is to experience what the view, the normal viewpoint of almost all Christians have been until the last hundred years or so. Um, we've gotten so used to modern medicine um, and the idea that we kind of have a safety net underneath us um, that we can take a lot of things for granted, especially the basic fragility of life. Um, and until the rise of modern medicine 100, 150 years ago, all Christians approached every Sunday uh, presuming that they lived on the edge of eternity. Um, and I think that adds a kind of pertinence or relevance to all former forms of worship and why you will see them um, oftentimes much more interested in discussions of life and death, heaven and hell. Um, you, you just, you couldn't relax. Um, literally, every morning when you woke up, regardless of your age, if you got sick, there was no guarantee that you were going to still be around at the end of the day. Um, and I hope this is making sense to people. I, I think the kind of what the pandemic has done is just enforced on us just how fragile life is and how much is not within our control. And if that's true, then perhaps it's good to look at um, our historical parents and to see how they handled sort of the fragility of life, what parts of the Bible were attractive to them, what was it that they, um, why did they love God, what was lovable about God with that sort of perspective, and what sort of songs did they want to sing? Yeah, that's super, that's really, really encouraging. And we're not the first, this isn't the first time the church has dealt with pandemic. Uh, no, 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 not at all. I, um, uh, if you'll give me just a second. I will show you uh, a good website um, that I would like to recommend to everyone.
Um, this is a website from the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and the Calvin Institute is a wonderful sort of clearinghouse, meeting ground for lots of different interests in worship and worship renewal. Um, and sure enough, they've put together just a web page on pandemics and public worship through history. Um, and you can scroll through it and just see that even beyond the normal fragility of life, uh, recurring pandemics have been something that the church has had to face, um, including some big names like John Calvin, who would be behind the Reformed tradition. Uh, there's Jonathan Edwards, the renowned uh, Puritan preacher in the early 18th century, Charles Spurgeon, a 19th century evangelist. Um, C.S. Lewis, Mass Hysteria, uh, and even this recent Ebola, 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 Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone. They had, yeah, I thought they had this. Um, but, you know, in many respects, um, the flu epidemic of 100 years ago, uh, to put this in perspective, this epidemic killed as many people in two years as AIDS has killed in 30, um, literally just whole towns decimated. Uh, unfortunately, it arose right as there was massive troop circulation in World War I, and American troops picked it up and circulated it all across Europe, and then from across there, it circulated around the world. Um, but, you know, I was looking through much of this material and uh, there are several kind of common themes here, and the and the um, Calvin people are very nice. Um, and what you'll notice uh, if you pull up this website is um, it wasn't like trying to minister in a pandemic was completely different than what you were doing week in and week out. Um, again, going back to this basic fragility of life. Um, it, it just intensified it and amplified it in a way. Um, and a lot of their worship actually was the worship as a lifestyle. Um, if, I, I know that's a theme that comes up a lot of time in people's teaching, and rightly so, that, that there's one way to honor God, and we can do that with our voices and our singing when we're all gathered together. Um, but there also is an honoring of God just in terms of sacrificial service and care for the other person. Um, uh, God says, I deserve, I, I require mercy, not sacrifice. Um, so sacrificial service on behalf of other people is a way of being involved in worship. And in pandemics, that's often the way the church leadership responds, is, is to lead corporate worship when they have an opportunity, but to also be the leaders in terms of active service in a variety of ways to other people. Um, there's even a wonderful, uh, let me find it, right there, right there. Um, uh, the Black Death in Wittenberg, Germany, 1527. So this is 10 years into the start of the Protestant Reformation. And uh, this is a letter that Martin Luther wrote about how concerned um, church leaders ought to be for their own welfare. And it's a very sort of gracious letter. And he says, um, you know, our gifts of faith will differ at this time. But if God has granted you um, a strong faith, uh, then you need to be very, very active in terms of not trying to, um, you need to be very, very active in terms of trying to help others uh, directly and physically. Uh, let me point out something else. While I'm sharing here, hopefully you can still see um, the web page that I've got up. This is mentioned in the Vineyard School of Worship, April 22nd. Can you all see that? 
Mm -hmm. um, so every website that I will refer to today, um, I've created a special page on my Duke website, sites.duke.edu backslash lruth. Um, and so if you want to try to follow these links on your own, you can go to that website, that page. Um, uh, and you can see it mentioned in the Vineyard School of Worship. There's the link right there, and you can, you can see everything that I was hoping to make reference to today. Um, so people don't have to try to track these things down as I'm talking about them. I'll just leave that up for a little bit, Mike. Yeah, that's great. We'll, we'll in the follow-up email, we'll, we'll provide that link as well. Okay, so, great. Yeah. Lester, you've, you've written um, a bit over the years about perseverance in Christian worship. And... Uh -huh. um, I wonder, I don't, I don't know what you're going to do, so I don't want to scoop you if you're going there, but I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit for our folks, because that's, I think, one of the, one of the most interesting uh, discoveries that you've made in your work is about the, way, the theme of perseverance over time. Uh, thanks, Caleb. I, I was going to plan on going there, but I don't mind doing that right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm originally from Texas, and we have a saying there that we want to make sure that we scratch where people are itching. So if that's the next natural question that comes up, I'm, I'm quite willing to start scratching right there. Um, and those of y'all not from Texas, just kind of bear with me as I, my <laughs> Texas folkisms come in. Um, I actually was going to go there, and I've provided a link to the article that I think you're referring to, Kalen, mm. where I do a comparison um, between the most used contemporary worship songs based on the CCLI Top 25 list and then the 70 most republished hymns in America from the mid-18th century to the start of the Civil War. And so I was just comparing them, what was similar and what was different. I mean, I can tell you what was similar. All of those songwriters love Jesus very, very, very much. That is what's similar. But what's different um, between the older hymnody and um, the contemporary worship songs is the theme of perseverance. And I think it really comes down to, um, to a Christian worldview, um, how you view the world. And um, I was struck uh, 200, 150 years ago, those Christians, those both the ones writing the songs and the ones singing them, uh, viewed Christian life in terms of a pilgrimage, pilgrimage motif as journey motif. Mm. Um, that is, there's a definite beginning point, and then you just uh, you keep putting your faithful step after faithful step after Jesus um, until you finally reach the goal at the end of the journey. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, one of the most read books in English-speaking Protestantism, apart from the Bible, was Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which is based on that whole metaphor um, that once somebody becomes a Christian, um, what the nature of life is, is a continued pilgrimage or a continued journey with a lot of speed bumps, a lot of dangers, a lot of threats, a lot of um, siren calls from the side to try to draw you off the path. And so a lot of what the, the older hymns tried to do was, one, remind you that this is a journey, two, that it's going to take perseverance and therefore patience and steadfastness, and three, that at the successful completion of it, um, God gives a crown of life to those who successfully complete it. Mm. Um, so one of the suggestions I was, I'm going to skip way ahead now, one of the suggestions I was actually going to make to everyone is that it might be a pastorally useful task right now to start to sing worship songs in a hymn form. And I don't necessarily mean older hymns, even though that might be one way to do it, 
Uh, but a hymn for itself is a formation and patience. Um, let's you know take a four or five verse hymn. Uh, the payoff of the hymn is not till the very end. Mm-hmm. And so the worshiper learns to be patient as you go through line after line. And the hymn builds and builds. And then finally, after at the very end of it, is the payoff. Um, so there's something about the older hymnody just in the structural form, even regardless of what it says, just in the structural form, I think built patience and perseverance. Whereas, you know, most um, modern worship songs, uh, two verses, um, chorus, pre-chorus, and bridge, and the ability to just kind of cycle through all of it, um, it creates a different sort of perspective of a kind of a perpetually upward cycle um, where the payoff can be immediate. Um, and I just think expecting immediate payoff right now doesn't fit the times. Um, uh, we don't know. Um, we don't know when the pandemic will be over. We don't even know exactly when the stay at home orders will be lifted. Um, so any way that you can use things either directly or indirectly like a hymn form in your worship to help people um, build patience in them, I think is a pastorally useful thing to do. Thanks. That That's so question, interesting. Caleb? It totally does. And the thing about the hymn structures is just fascinating. I mean, I'm thinking through like, Amazing Grace does that, and Joy to the World does that, and so many hymns that, you know, we really, that I've sung a thousand times, but I've never really thought about the fact that they take you on a journey, except maybe implicitly, because I tend to like the third verse more than the fourth verse, you know, the ones that are like talking about no more let sin grow and such. (laughs) Uh, That's great. Yeah, um, if... If folks actually wanted to access the text that I'm talking about, the fourth link down, um, in order to be able to study them, I actually put together a Word document, which I've converted to a PDF here. And these would be all the lyrics of those 70 hymns, um, uh, most republished in America from 1737, which is when the first hymnal was published till the start of the Civil War in 1861 and Mm. you can just start reading through those and and what i was talking about the payoff is at the very end so the structure itself mimics the vision for what the christian life is yeah that's brilliant can you give us the uh three minute version of and maybe we can post the link to it as well Jesus has always been uh, your boyfriend. Is that it? <laughs> well, oh. Give us the, you know, the critique of modern worship. And oftentimes in our blogosphere and chat is that uh, modern worship, uh, you know, has leaned so, so much to intimacy and the personal narrative. Um, can you, can you give us a little bit of, of that? Cause I think that'll be new for, for many people. Sure. Sure. Um, there, in a lot of popular literature, including blogs, uh, there are often two complaints made about contemporary worship songs. Uh, one is that they are um, 7-Eleven songs. There are seven words sung 11 times. Um, the other complaint is that they're all Jesus is my boyfriend songs. Um, let me just say up front, I don't agree with either one of those complaints, um, and neither one of them are actually true. Uh, but the, I think what the Jesus is my boyfriend um, critique, if I can even call it that, is trying to get at what I would consider both a strength and a weakness to a lot of modern worship songs. Uh, the strength of a lot of these songs is that they use um, images and manner of speaking that are very accessible because they're pulled from the culture. And especially in the vineyard with the strong emphasis on intimacy, 
um, a lot of the internal vineyard sort of imaging of God and relationship with God is put in relational terms. And so the, and there are great upsides to that. That makes the songs and their images accessible. It makes the images of God understandable. Um, it gives people a way of thinking, oh, this is what um, the Bible's expecting of me. Um, that I'm supposed to be in this kind of positive, loving relationship um, with God or with Jesus. Uh, that's the upside. Um, did that make sense, Mike? So the downside is when um, songwriters can't go beyond those images. Um, because no one set of um, images exhaust the way Scripture talks about the way God and people um, have connection to each other. I'm not even trying to. I'm trying to avoid the language relate to each other right there. Um, and I, I think that would be a fair co- critique that there that there. Um, there are other ways of um, talking about and relating to God that um, the, the strongly kind of relational, particularly romantic relational sort of images don't get at. Um, a, a suggestion I was going to make to everyone today in terms of your worship planning, and this, uh, this is where it naturally fits in, is as you're thinking, trying to Think through songs uh, and the picking of songs for a turbulent time like today. I would encourage you to do something that that I call biblical narrative association. And so instead of first trying to pick the song and trying to find a theme that seems relevant, think of a, a figure or a person, a biblical character who experienced something that felt like this in the Bible. And then once you kind of identify with that biblical character, ask the question, if that person knew your congregation song repertoire, what would they be singing? Uh, and so it, it connects your song repertoire with a biblical figure. And so it can help kind of reframe the lyrics. Um, uh, this is not a pandemic sort of choice, but I, I mean, I played around with it. I've been playing around with this for a long time. Um, uh, the old Paul Balash song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, I Want to See You High and Lift It Up. Uh, some of y'all, if you're older like I am, um, Ancient of Days like I am, some of y'all will remember that older song from the 90s. Um, I started playing around with that song in the context of the transfiguration of Christ. Mm. And I thought, yeah. I can imagine Peter and the other two singing, open the eyes of my heart. Lord, I want to see you high and lift it up. And then all of a sudden, um, those lyrics didn't feel trite anymore because I could put them into a biblical story. And so, um, you know, my encouragement to you is to think through what Bible characters have been through something that is approximates or is close uh, to the pandemic that we're, we're experiencing right now. Um, gosh, what, I was thinking about this. Oh, man. When the Lord sent a uh, serpent that he, serpents that he sent through the camp of the Israelites, and they were all getting bent and dying. Am I remembering the story correctly? Mm-hmm. And, um, and Moses was instructed. He, he, uh, he made the snake out of metal and put it up on the stick, raised it up. Everyone who looked up at that were saved. And it's like, okay, what would those people want to sing after they had just looked up? And in the midst of that terrifying experience where there seemed to be no way out of it, what would those folks want to sing? And then, you know, if they knew my church's song repertoire, what songs would they pick? Uh, If I was a composer, what songs would I want to write for those folks? What would I want to put on their lips? Um, So this is my Technique of biblical narrative association. Um, I'm in academia, so sometimes I got to come up with these fancy labels just to make um, make it feel like I'm earning my keep, um, my earning my salary. So just bear with me. But essentially, it's it's just to try to think through our experience f- 
from the, the shoes of somebody in the Bible and trying to figure out our song selections from that viewpoint. Hmm. Yeah, and I apologize to everyone. I Man, once I start talking, I just keep going, don't I? So I pause. Sorry no, about that. No, you're great, man. This is great. Uh, let me ask you another question then. So it, maybe this is an obvious question, but can we connect the, could you connect the dots a little bit between the thing you said around perseverance okay. and the fact that the vineyards worship heartbeat, if you like, is intimacy or has classically been intimacy, right? What's the relationship between intimacy and perseverance? We might need to get a marriage counselor in here to talk about this, but from a worship perspective, what would you have to say about that? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, I would want to say that and I'm going to bring in um, um, my understanding of marriage. My wife and I are coming up on 35 years. There you go. I, and I would think for most long-lasting marriages or long-lasting romantic relationships, there is a slow shift from intensity to permanence, intensity to perseverance mm. in a way, um, and that you almost want love to shift like that. Um, Yeah. And, and I think you want it to be intense at the beginning mm. and immediate and overwhelming and just overwhelmingly passionate because, I mean, that's what jumpstarts the relationship. But what maintains it over time is steadfastness. Mm. Um, and if you think about it, we commit ourselves to that in wedding vows, but... Uh, but the, even the phrasing of it, till death do us part, is such a downer. You know, I don't think it's the phrase most of us are locking on at that very moment of looking in our beloved's eyes. Um, you know, and in fact, it, we're probably not even locking in on the implicit sort of perseverance for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer in sickness and in health. I mean, there's um, the only way to fulfill those vows is by being primarily committed to persevering uh, um, because if you're married for any length of time, that's what's going to happen. Um, at the risk of telling a really gross story, so let me just tell a story here. Um, I was very blessed to, uh, when my wife and I, my fiance at the time, we were engaged and I was in my first pastorate. And um, it, it was a great church. It was in a retirement resort community. And so we were in our mid twenties and everybody else in the church was 65 and older. Uh, my lay leader was 85. He and his wife had gotten married in 1926, I think it was. Um, Something like that. I mean, it was just crazy. And so this fellow, Norris Trostel was his name. And if anybody's related to Norris Trostel in the group, just bear with me. I love Norris, or Trost as we called him. He said, I, Lester, I want to tell you what, what true love is really like. He said, there was one day when we had small children and Joyce, my wife, was sick. And she was so sick, she couldn't get out of bed. Uh, and that meant the, these kids, these toddlers, had free reign of the house for the entire day. And after a while, after they had messed their diapers, they decided just to take them off and give themselves free reign with all their bodily functions and all of our carpet um, all day long. And uh, they discovered that that was great fun to play in. And I came home, very sick wife in bed, and... My kids, um, having imitated um, Italian winemakers squishing grapes all day with their feet, uh, having smushed in their own bodily output into all of our <laughs> carpet. He says, that's what marriage is really like. Is that what you're signing up for? 
Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I was 26. I said, sure. Um, but he was absolutely right. Not exactly that story, but what keeps you going is a fundamental sort of perseverance. Um, where I think this is hard for us, and it, it, perhaps particularly hard for the vineyard with the emphasis, dual emphasis on intimacy um, and the idea, and this is a strength in the early vineyard, that you can have that intimate relationship with God now. Um, and the worship services, they were that way. I mean, it, there's wonderful stories about people showing up way early just to make sure that they would get a seat because God was going to show up and uh, it was going to be immediate um, and overwhelming. Um, that's the intensity and the immediacy. But what do you do now when God seems far off and, and you look out the window and you look at the news and it doesn't seem to be but a lot of bodily function squashed into the carpet? Um, it, it's, it's love is perseverance um, is steadfastness mm. um, that will carry us through That's cool. and I'm not sure we always have songs that help us there um, to prepare for today believe it or not I've actually been thinking back 20 years um, to 9-11 uh, mm. in 2001 uh, which was a Tuesday. I was in a different school, but I was in a school that had chapel every Tuesday and Thursday about 10 o'clock Eastern time. And so uh, if you remember, the plane started crashing early that morning, and by 9.30, it was obvious we were in the midst of something terrible. And um, my school had chapel, maybe 11? I think it was 10. But anyway... Uh, I can't remember. I felt so bad for the worship leader. Um, he had selected a worship set and he got up there with his guitar and he started leading us through that set. And all I could think of was one, these are marvelous songs, but two, they're not fitting. Uh, and how we would have been much better served just to have laid aside our plans and open the Bible, particularly the Psalms. And and have just asked people what psalms come to mind and bring you comfort right now? And what songs do you know that you feel naturally arising in your heart that would bring you comfort? Um, and I think it actually would have been more worshipful, more honoring of God, because none of our hearts were into the very strong, upbeat, very rhythmic praise songs that morning 20 years ago. And I tell you, well, they're not, I'm not feeling that on a lot of Sunday mornings right now either. The, the, kind of, in my mind, at least this is connected. Is you know, how do you turn perseverance into actual practice? Um, and yeah, so I think I, I think relying upon the Bible in new and different ways is one of the ways to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. That's great. What do you got, Mike? Yeah, encourage you guys to keep sending questions. We've got some good stuff coming in here. Oh, um, wonderful. Yeah, Because so, I've just about shot my entire original wad here. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so let's see here. Where was it? Where was it? Um, what music was contemporary music birthed out of? Vineyard music evolved from somewhere. What was that bridge? Oh, that's an interesting. That's a great question. Um, gosh, I, oh, I'm such an egghead academic. I apologize. I can't think of one simple answer uh, because I don't think there is one simple answer. Yeah. So let me try to break this down um, in bits. Uh, one bit is a surge of choruses starting in the mid 20th century. So, I mean, most Protestants were singing hymns, multiple verses, and sometimes a verse and a refrain that you went to after every verse. Um, 
but in lots of different places, including Pentecostalism in the mid 20th century, you started getting choruses only. Um, and so, so a simpler form that was just um, four or five lines, perhaps. And so you have those circulating 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, that's one kind of source. And oftentimes those are coming from people who don't like rock and roll and popular music. So that's why I'm not lumping everything together. Um, uh, uh, composers you might know, uh, the Gaithers would write in that fashion if you know any of their older stuff from the 60s or 70s, or we see, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, geek time, geek time. So, I mean, older songbooks like this, uh, this, is, this is a wonderful one from a youth ministry in the 1940s. Um, this is a similar sort of thing. Nice. Um, but it's not even taking place just in English speaking. Um, there's a surge of these choruses called gritos in Spanish in Central and South America at the same time. Um, that's one source. So the, these shorter, simpler forms, choruses. Uh, the second source would be really popular forms of music making, um, which uh, the Jesus People Movement in the late 60s into the early 70s um, help put on the map, um, and that that would be especially among the Calvary chapels uh, originating there um, in Southern California in Orange County. Um, that's really the, well, it's not the only, but because uh, the Jesus people were everywhere. In fact, uh, uh, this is Life Magazine from 1972. This is uh, cover uh, Explo 72. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta love these folks. Um, these are the final concert attracted 180,000 people. Um, uh, this is in Dallas, 1972, in the middle of the summer. If you've ever been in Texas in the middle of the summer, how you could get 180,000 people willing to park themselves under the Texas sun all day long is, well, they had amazing music. But that's a popular form of music making, and so you're going to see um, uh, rhythm sections, um, uh, guitars, um, that sort of thing. Amazingly, in the first Calvary Chapel, all of that stuff is relegated to evening Bible studies. It's not part of um, Sunday morning worship, uh, which is still pretty conservative. Um, but guess who led one of those evening Bible studies at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa? Ken Gullickson. I think he had the Friday night one. And so when he began church planting in homes, um, he carried the nighttime Bible study sensibility to Sunday morning. And so Vineyard, in the scope of the whole thing, Vineyard is the one that I really think put bands and popular forms of music making on the map. Um, and from y'all, it will eke out across this entire praise and worship world. Um, and bit by bit through the 80s and then by the 90s. This is the flood that overwhelms everybody. Um, and then in the mid 90s, you're gonna have a major shift in all of the music making. Um, what uh, one scholar calls the British invasion. Um, so you start getting kind of a new sound, a new form, even a new structure for worship songs. Um, Bridges. I'm sorry? Bridges. You get bridges. Um, I, anybody want to take a wild guess what the first top song with a top worship song with a bridge is? Mm. I could sing of your love forever. Yeah. Delirious, 1995. Yeah. Um, prior to that, nobody sang bridges mm. in terms of worship songs. And then after that, 
Um, woe be unto you if you try to write a worship song now without a bridge. Um, it's, um, so that it's that's correlated with CCLI when you say top. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I've got all of the top 25 lists from CCLI from 1989 forward, which is when they put out their first list. And so I'm able to do um, a variety of sort of analyses of that sort of thing. Um, can I toss out one little tidbit? Yeah. It, um, it, it's interesting. I took the 10 list from the first five years. So there are two lists a year. And so I took the first 10 lists. There's amazingly not a single vineyard composer on any of the top 25 lists. Mm. Um, and so I've got this theory working in the back of my mind that in the broader world, and I would love to kind of follow this up with, um, with vineyard folks later on. I'm, I'm wondering if it's not until the Toronto blessing and the Brownsville revival that really puts vineyard music songs, lots of them on the wider sort of um, perspective of this whole world. Mm. Um, that's just, that's a guess right now. I'm not putting that in the book because I do not have that tied down, but um, I, I was just mesmerized by the fact that even John Wimber um, spirit song is not on the top. First yeah, I, w I wonder if the publishing had even been uh, connected with CCLI at that time yet. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think probably so, because um, John Wimber is very uh, astute market-wise um, and would have been... Um, he would have been careful, I think, to have found outlets. And amazingly, um, starting about 84, 85, 86 or so, I find references to John Wimber everywhere. Hmm. Um, I, I wish I would have had that man's frequent flyer miles. I mean, he is showing up in charismatic renewal movements. He's going to England. Um, he's showing up in uh, charismatic meetings. Um, uh, yeah, he's just everywhere, and so there's there's a there's a there's a public dimension to the vineyard mid '80s and after that I don't think it quite has mid '80s and earlier. But I'm way off the track now in terms of talking about the pandemic. But the, my apologies. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, looking at some more questions here. Come. Oh, in. thank you, Jason. Yeah. Hey, I have a question, Lester. This is a little bit of something someone sent in. What's your uh, take on the relationship between the, the sort of connection of early vineyard and sort of renewal music to the Roman Catholic uh, worship stream? And because I don't feel like we see a lot of that connection today. It seems like there was an intersection with the Roman Catholic Church in terms of renewal uh, in the eighties that seems to have faded away. Is that correct? And what do you think is going on there? Uh, yes. And I will just apologize up front that this will seem like Caleb has just set me up for an advertisement. Oh, come on. But, <laughs> but, um, I actually, I wanted to, one of the things I wanted to talk about today, just cause I thought y'all might be interested is in this book that I just edited because, and I had it marked, um, there's one whole essay, let me see if I can get this. There's one whole essay on John Wimber's influence on the charismatic renewal movement in Catholicism. Hey, there you go. Um, and so his circulation through charismatic Catholics is part of what's happening. Um, mm. and, uh, the essay will make the point, um, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, Catholic charismatics become vineyardized mm. um, starting mid 80s or so and it caused some disruption in their own community because I could sense this is this is not our natural spirituality but um, um, and 
you know, I, as I'm watching some of the comments come in, I don't want to tie it just to that. One of the amazing things about the 70 and 70s and 80s period prior CCLI is how porous the boundary lines of sharing were. Um, songs just circulated and somebody would hear it someplace and then they would take it home to their own congregation and maybe tweak it um, or take it to another congregation and tweak it. Um, and so when I said the songs weren't appearing on the top 25 CCLI list, I'm quite sure that vineyard songs were circulating at the time, um, just illegally, um, like everybody else was sharing songs too. In fact, the materials are often quite funny. The, they'll, um, I've been, I just got through going through 10 years of the Psalmist magazine, which is the original worship leader magazine starting in 95 uh, mm -hmm. in 85. And they have a song insert section there. And, um, and uh, they'll oftentimes put in a song and they'll go, you know, authorship unknown. And then they'll say, but we apologize if this is actually your song and you wrote it, let us know. And we will attribute it in the future to you. We're not trying to intentionally um, steal from you. Um, um, so it, it was, it was like, um, it was like food coloring let loose in a stream. I mean, once you, squirted that food coloring in a creek it's just going to mix through the entire water so um so i'm quite confident that notwithstanding the direct links between wimber and the catholic charismatics there is vineyard stuff that is circulating widely even if people don't know it's vineyard mm. but the personal connection made a difference it was like yes because like out here and i'm in philadelphia you know we have a lot of charismatic Catholics that were in Maryland, Delaware, Philly area, New Jersey, a lot of them actually knew and worked with Wimber uh, because yeah. he came out and did meetings. And then like Neil Lozano, there's a bunch of people like this. And uh, he would bring songs and sometimes musicians. Uh, yes. And that's how it maybe got into their world. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to discount that at all. Mm. I mean, it's amazing how much Wimber traveled. John Wimber traveled mid eighties and beyond. Yeah. I mean, he was traveling a lot prior to that with um, particularly when he was working for a fuller seminary. Um, but yeah, I, I yeah, don't have anything to add to that. Caleb, yeah, yeah. But, um, what um, I think we'll, we've probably got maybe 10 minutes or so left. We'll, we'll answer a few other questions okay. and, and wrap and we can kind of, our off ramp can be soft. We can kind of slowly, slowly bring it, bring it back. Um, you know, my dog's doing good. He is not up here bothering me yet. So I'm good to go. Um, some people are asking about uh, different, I can tell from different generations, um, this idea in the vineyard that, uh, you know, the, we had our glory days, you know, and some of us, even on this call, were here during the glory days. We remember what, um, you know, when we read articles about people that are experiencing Bethel uh, in Reading today, it's, it, it's some of the same language, you know, of being caught up in um, quite an experience with the Lord and with the church. Um, what does the future hold for us as a movement like this, looking at, you know, cycles of, of, of worship renewal in other movements and kind of how that's played out as things have settled into normalcy, quote unquote, um, from the extraordinary to the ordinary? What, what does the future hold for us? What encouragement do you have, you know, Maybe it's an impossible question to answer. I just, I see a few questions about that. Uh, sure. A way to move forward. Uh, and I will show my age here again, too. There's a wonderful song from the group Second Chapter of Acts from the 1970s, yeah. uh, which they essentially say, why are you trying to plan the future? Because you don't even know and you can't control which way the wind is going to blow. Mm. Um, 
you know, what does the future hold for the vineyard? Well, I'm, I'm a historian, not a prophet, so I'm much better looking backwards than I am forwards. But looking backwards at other movements, um, I think... I think you'll have a glorious future, even if the label vineyard's not attached to it. Um, and, and maybe that may take some institutional humility to be willing to accept. But the global impact of the vineyard, if you think about the impact that y'all have had on charismatic renewal, if you particularly among in the Church of England, um, I mean, y'all have reshaped the Church of England, um, even though the vineyard label is not attached mm -hmm. to it. Um, I, I also am impressed by the fact that of all the different strands of, um, of this new way of worship that came out of the 50s and 60s and 70s, um, Y'all are, I think, the most thoughtful strand. Um, and in terms of being able to ask good questions about it yourself, of trying to develop um, the sort of internal resources, including scholars, that can help keep asking good questions. Um, I mean, I think it's just natural for all religious movements to shift over from intensity to perseverance yeah. in a way. Um, I mean, there, it, um, I was a volunteer fireman in my first church. So an image that comes from that, uh, you know, I soon learned there were two ways for a fire to consume a house. One of them, one of the ways was an explosive come from um, just being the, all the flames just wrapping up the house and just consuming it all at once, um, which is amazing to see. The other way for a fire to consume a structure is a slow burn. Mm. And that over time, eventually the entire thing is consumed by fire. And as a historian, I think in most religious movements, that's what happens. Um, if they stay faithful, if they don't stay faithful, they don't burn at all. But if they stay faithful, what you get is a slow burn that will bit by bit consume the whole. Um, and that can be a hard shock to a movement system to make that shift. I mean, I can, I can point to predecessors in Methodism, uh, Baptists, Puritans, Early Pentecostals, um, you know, after you get in about two to three generations, there's always a generation of croakers, just all the old guys like me who say, oh, we're leaving our glory days. You know, we're not like we were. Well, you know, you're not like you were. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the fire is out. Um, so, I mean, on the whole, I see positive signs that the fire is still uh, live and burning in the vineyard, even if it's a slow burn. Amen. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. I, I would. Just, I don't. I don't have anything new. Just stay the course. Yeah. Um, I Leslie, think from, me, from can, intensity have... from intensity to perseverance, I think is uh, is a line that's that's definitely sticking with me. Sorry, Caleb. Go. go no, ahead. no, that's fine. Look, can I just let me ask you one question? Sure. Do you think there's an, and this can apply to worship or just church history more broadly, and I think it, the connections are clear. Do you think there's a necessary opposition between spirit and structure? Or do the two in the best of situations work together? Because some of the romanticism of the early vineyard days is how unstructured things were or how God was just depositing stuff sort of spontaneously, randomly. Um, and clearly there were some moments like that. But one of the questions that I'm constantly wrestling with 
uh, is this question of the relationship between spirit and structure. I'm not so sure it's as simple. Well, if it is as simple as spirit first, structure second, then every story is a story of decline. Yeah, I, yeah. I, don't, buy, I don't buy that. No, me either. So talk to me about that a little bit. I remember what a, a, one of my seminary professors once said, a, addressing the same topic in class one day. He said, the body without the spirit is a corpse, but the spirit without a body is a ghost. Um, and so the two belong together. Um, and in fact, I think this is a good understanding of Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit, you do not have the body of Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who brings about the conception in the Virgin Mary. That literally, his first body is dependent upon the movement of the Spirit. And then, uh, the Apostle Paul is quite clear in portraying, it is by the Spirit that that body is raised from the tomb. So there's no resurrected body. Uh, without the spirit. So I don't oppose the two. Uh, never do. Yeah. Um, that's, just, that's just a slippery slope into unbiblical, unclassical, unorthodox Christianity, I think. Yeah. The key is when the most obvious aspect of it day to day seems to be the body and not the spirit. Um, and so, as a historian, I just expect God every once in a while just to kind of shake things completely up and bring about a new strong spirit movement. Mm -hmm. And I, oftentimes I wonder, I, I wonder if we misjudge what God's intentions are. Oh, my goodness, I can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> um, so, Lord, as you're listening, I'm not trying to be presumptive on it, okay? Um, but... Oftentimes, because spirit movements are so wonderful in terms of the freshness and everything, I wonder if sometimes we think, well, that's what God intended was this new spirit movement. But I wonder if God really just did this to kind of shake things up and allow a spirit infusion into the already existing larger body that was in danger of kind of... You know, losing it. It's it's um it's like these spirit movements or the caffeine shots every morning. Um, I mean, you can't live just on caffeine. Um, but a little shot of it every once in a while can be greatly reinvigorating. Um, and I hope at the final judgment, none of this is coming back to haunt me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean that I I just I just think. It's a false dichotomy, it, and it has to be a false dichotomy if you actually look at Jesus in his fullness, because mm. he's the fullness of God in bodily form. Um, I, I mean, fullness of God, I'm all for that. Bodily form? Yeah, I mean, that. in fact, that's part of the mystery of it, mm. part of the wonder and love of it. Um, and, and so... If I live in a church form that's got body to it, that's not fearful to me. Um, that's, that's awesome. Great. Right. Thanks. That's really good. Guys, you're doing a great job. We've only lost 10% uh, of our participants. <laughs> oh, very good. Well, that's because I... That, that was the 10% I couldn't send out their checks ahead of time. So I appreciate everybody staying put. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great, it's a great sign. Um, well, so, I know everybody's wondering how, how close will Lester lapse over into um, um, unorthodox doctrine? I mean, because I'm really, I'm trying not to, but anyway, I'm thinking um, off the top of my head. So uh, I've got, one, I've got a quarantine-related question here that, okay. we can, that we can end with. But before we do that last one, um, Lester, I've um, I've been traveling the past four years and been to um, I don't know probably seventy plus vineyard churches, just helping them co-lead worship and doing teaching and training. Um, 
we have a pretty incredible range. Uh, you know, when Caleb's talking about um, uh, what was the phrase you used, like from structure to uh, to just chaos of, you know, swinging from the chandeliers church, we have this incredible spectrum now in practice. So mm-hmm. in some of our churches, John Piper would be out there shaking his head up and down. And some of our churches, Bill Johnson would be going, you know, it's like we've got this incredible range of practice um, you know, in, in my vineyard church, you know, we've been working through the lectionary for two years, you know, um, the Eucharist has made a robust, uh, entrance into the vineyard, um, the structure of the church calendar and things like that, like just the ordinary, um, there's this incredible, uh, diversity in the vineyard, um, to coming from when I did some research, I, I learned that early in the vineyard, you know, pastors would roll their eyes and pick straws of who had to preach on Easter, you know, who had to preach at Christmas, you know, they just, um, what, what is that? Is that a sign of goodness and health? How can we, um, uh, is that good? Is that, does that mean that we're watering down our stream? Um, or that you know we we bless the the Anglicans and now a lot of our a lot of our the Anglican you know we're starting to look more like Anglicans <laughs> in some of our uh, in some of our worship and our practice is that good? Can you speak into that? Is that normal uh, for a movement to um, to widen like that? Yes, it is good and normal. I would say it's even scriptural. Um, one of the biggest sort of um, urban myths, I'll just call it that, that I come across as a worship teacher from time to time, is that the Christians of the first century only had one way of worshiping. Um, and if you look at the New Testament itself, you can actually see a pretty good bit of diversity, um, even in the first two or three generations of Christians. Um and so I think that's a strength. Um, but not having to insist upon uniformity is one of the internal strengths of biblical Christianity. And if y'all see that play out in yourselves in a fairly short time period, I would, I would see that as a sign of that sort of biblical strength as long as as y'all can stay focused on some essentials. And, and the one that comes to mind, and perhaps I think this, and this will sound like a commercial again, but the one reason I would encourage you to read this book is to read um, John Wimber's sermons about loving God. Um, mm. And so if you have a vineyard congregation that has a very strong attraction to the Lord's Supper, um, use of um, uh, written out prayers, things that were not intrinsic, you know, are immediate to these folks. I'd say that's okay as long as those are still used as means of expressing love for God and are the means by which people experience the love of God. Um, it's when you lose the love that I think it's problematic. Um, Good. And, and, you know, and the prep questions you sent me, Mike, um, you made reference to the the standard already, not yet sort of tension that circulates a lot in, in vineyard thinking. And there are different ways to parse that, but, you know, when I was reading, when I read the New Testament, uh, I was reading Colossians 3 today, the already part, I think consistently in the New Testament, always comes back to love. It might be love and power. It might be love and signs. It might be love and miracles. Um, it might be love and intensity. But what's always there is love. Now, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is 
love. And I think it's because ultimately pure love, thorough, overwhelming, thoroughly reforming is the nature of human existence and our final transformation after Jesus comes back. Um, and so notwithstanding the diversity of actual practices, um, you know, if the congregations are using their practices to express their love for God and are finding the love of God in those practices, I'd say, bless them. That's good. Keep on. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great ending, ending point for us. I really appreciate you. Um, we, we, we traveled so far, this could be part one of 10. <laughs> but, um, it's it's so good. Thank you, Caleb, for speaking into things and sure. walking with Great us and, and Melissa helping us out on the back end. You guys asked some really good questions, and um, this will be available on our website at Vineyard Worship. We, we've got a resource page there, um, and this this will be archived there, and you'll be able to go back and, and listen to it. And we'll have, I think, in the Zoom Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong. In the Zoom follow-up email, can we put these links here? We'll be able to yes. do that, so mm -hmm. you guys can expect that in your um, in your follow-up. So yeah, we had we had well over 125 active attendees on this call, and, and wow. just a just a wonderful gift. Thank you, Lester. For, my pleasure. My pleasure. For your time, if you if you wouldn't mind just ending with a with a prayer, and uh, we'll we'll finish out. Sure. The, the early Methodist, which is where my original research was, um, uh, they'd like to talk about gathering before the throne of grace. So if we could do that, please, in prayer. Lord, we would have no hope if you had not sent your son, Jesus. But you have sent him. And then you resent him again in his resurrection. And through him, you have poured out blessing upon blessing, and we give you thanks for that. For everyone who's preceded us in the faith, who've exemplified his spirit in this world, we would give you thanks. For those who are exemplifying his sacrificial spirit right now, we would give you thanks. And for your provision of the grace of your spirit to these fine folks and their leadership of worship, I would give you thanks for them too and ask that you would pour out your spirit upon them in ever deepening measure so that they might have true heavenly wisdom and that their lives, their songs, their minds, indeed their very beings would exemplify your presence, your presence of love in this world. This we would ask for in your son's name. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's a gift. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Appreciate you. And, uh, yeah, every Wednesday, for the most part, through this time, we're going to have something here to, uh, to consume, enjoy, and watch. So we'll see you back here uh, next week. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. I appreciate the honor.